This is the Helping Up Podcast, all about addiction, recovery, and grace. I'm Vic King, chaplain at Helping Up Mission. Today, a conversation between Pastor Gary Byers, our deputy director, and Anthony Jones, known around here as AJ. AJ is a recent graduate of our spiritual recovery program and now an intern at Helping Up Mission, and he shares his story. We hope it's an encouragement to you. So, uh, Anthony Jones, here we go. Uh, you are a Baltimore guy. Yes. Grew up where? Uh, West Baltimore. West Baltimore. Um, Sandtown. Early on in my um, my childhood, I think I was like five. It was Christmas time, and um, we lived on Madison Avenue. And um, my room was like connected to the dining room. I heard a noise and woke up. And I seen Santa Claus in our kitchen put my mother's silverware in his red and white bag. And I kind of got excited because it was Santa Claus. I made a noise and he pointed a gun at me and I froze. After he went out the window, my mom came in the next morning and I was still sitting on the side of the bed, froze. Wow. Sandtown and then... um. When I was like 12 and a half, we moved up to Park Circle area, mm-hmm. Park Heights and Rice's Town. Yep. So um, who who in your family, who'd you grow up with in your in your house? Who was there? Myself, my younger brother, my mom, and uh, my younger brother's father. I didn't know he was my stepfather. You thought he was your father. Yeah, I, I thought he was my father. I didn't find out he wasn't my biological father until I was uh, 12. And that was hard for you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In the beginning, I didn't like the ideal of somebody that wasn't my father chastising me, Mm -hmm. or should I say disciplining Mm -hmm. me. Then after uh, there was an incident at dinner one night, I hadn't got enough to eat, and I asked for a little more. When he sat the plate down, I said I didn't want that much. And um, he said, I put it on your plate and you're going to eat it. Or I'm going to whoop you. And um, I said, uh, you're not my father. You're not going to touch me. You know how they say in the book of James, they talk about how the tongue is a two-edged sword. Yeah. It cuts like a knife. I could see the pain instantly come mm-hmm. on his face. And my spirit instantly convicted me because everything he ever done for me flashed back through my mind wow. while I was sitting there. And... um. I said then I made myself a promise that uh, I would do everything in my power not to do that to him again. Twelve years old. Twelve years old. That's pretty good. When so we, he wasn't he he wasn't your father, but he was a dad to you. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's nice. How about your mom? You got a pretty good relationship with her now. Yes. Even when I was in the middle of my mess, it's always been good. Uh, One time she contemplated buying me a scooter thinking that the scooter was going to stop me from getting high. And I looked at her and said, I'm so glad you did not buy me a scooter. And she looked at me and she said, why? Because it had a went in a crack pipe with everything else. Yeah. Well, um, what age did you start getting high? Eight or nine. Drugs or alcohol? Marijuana. When did it become a regular thing for you? I would say uh, 15 or 16, and it was marijuana. From 9 until I say about 15 or 14, it Mm -hmm. was once in a blue moon thing. Gotcha. Not on a constant basis. And the reason reason you didn't do it constantly those years was? Limited access. So nothing really bad happened in your life at that point. It was just I now had access, and I was going to do it. Right. Um, what's the next drug that came in? It would be uh, cocaine. And how old were you then? Cocaine, I was uh, 17. So a couple years later, you graduated from marijuana to cocaine. Yeah. Um, where are you with school? At 15, you were in school still? Yes. All right. And 17 in school still? No. No. We no. left school. Now, what, what yeah, was— I didn't you? laugh. I, got, I put myself out of school. Yes. Yeah, nice. Well, well, well said. Um, uh, what? Where were you in school? What grade and what school? Uh, eighth. Eighth grade at where? 
Uh, it was Green Spring Middle School. Okay, and so they they put you out. No, I you put, put myself yourself out. out. Yeah, and uh, and then. Mm -hmm. So when did you finally get it? What your high school diploma? Haven't. Never did. Are you working on it here now? Yes, I am. I'm in the EDP class here. Good for you. Good for you. All right. So um, you were still living at home at 17. When did you stop living at home? When I was 18, I was like back and forth. Did you ever wind up living on the streets? Oh, yes. 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 So once you were gone from mom and, and in between girlfriends, the, it was it was just living on the streets. Mm-hmm. Because I chose to. Yeah. Because I could always go home. The times when I would call my mom, she would be like, you all right? It's like, eh, sort of kind. I'm all right, though. Sort of kind. Always, just before I decided to get off the phone, she would always ask when you coming home. You know you don't have to be out there. You can come home. And you didn't go home because? I caught myself being a man. You ain't supposed to be home with mommy when you're a man. Supposed to take care of yourself. So even though you're living on the streets, I'm taking care of myself. Yeah. Handling my business. Yeah, but for real, for real, I wasn't taking care of myself. Other people was taking care of me. <laughs> even yeah. when I worked, I didn't take care of myself because I used my money to get her. Yeah. So it was somebody else taking care of me. Yeah. Wasn't me taking care of me. It was the illusion of me taking care of me. Yeah. And uh didn't know a whole lot about God, knew a little teeny tiny bit about him. But I used to talk to him all the time, so I just talked to him. Mm hmm So just give me a, 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 a synopsis. You said that you really didn't know a lot about God, but a little bit, but you actually had a sense that he was there, and so you you know, you threw up that prayer. Where did you get the little bit of God knowledge you had? My mother. When we were little, you know, like you have encyclopedias? Mm -hmm. We had Bible encyclopedias. We had um, a Bible that told God's story with pictures mm -hmm. that my mom bought us when we was little children. And she used to read us what it said and show us the pictures when we were little. It was like her way of reading us a bedtime story, the nights yeah. when she wasn't working. Yeah. I was like, uh, I've always been like curious about God, especially when um, I found out that the man I thought was my biological father wasn't my biological father. I always wanted to know what did I do wrong? Yeah. Because I thought he yeah. didn't stick around because I'd done something wrong. Yeah. Um, it wasn't until um, I think it was about 30 on Greenmount Avenue at I Can Weekend yep. at St. Anne's Church. I was in that program. I read a book while I was there called The Purpose Driven Life. That like really opened my eyes because it's a segment in there, <clears throat> it's a chapter in there that talks about the DNA that God needed to create me was the DNA of my father and my mother. Not necessarily that they had to stay together, but he needed that DNA to create it me. Interesting. That like reading that and like understanding that, because for a minute I didn't understand that. So I got to ask, asking the pastor that was there a lot of questions. And he was like, why are you asking me so many? I said, because I want to understand. I said, because majority part of my life, I thought I always done something wrong for my father not to be around. This releases me from yes. thinking that it was my fault. It yeah. was just how it was supposed to be. And if it was just how it was supposed to be, I need to know that so I can, like, let this go. Yeah. So um, he explained a lot of stuff to me. He was like, that's how it's supposed to be. He just needed that DNA to create you. If he wasn't supposed to stay in the picture, he wasn't supposed to stay in the picture. And I was good with that. Yeah. Yeah. But it took till 30 to get that straight. Yeah. 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 When I came here, I had all, all the intentions on staying clean. I made it my first time my first time here for recovery, I made it into life prep. Y'all helped me get a job at John Hopkins. I was getting ready to go to work at John Hopkins and I had a fiance. I applied for overnight and he denied me. And I think I said, no, I know I said some things that I shouldn't have said. Back then, I ain't know nothing about my situation being my situation. I ain't know nothing about staying in my own lane. I want what I want when I want it, and I want it. 
When I got my second paycheck, I left. I went back home. And home was with your fiance then? No, well, then home with, was with my mom. With mom, yeah. went back home with mom. Yeah, we had moved from um, Park Circle area back to um, Sandtown. Did you stay clean? I stayed clean for about almost four months. A week and a half from completing my probationary period at Hopkins, and I got arrested. I didn't do anything wrong. I went into a um, store around my neighborhood that was on Landville and um, Fulton Avenue. Went to the store, bought a pack of Newports. I'm standing in the store doorway opening my Newports, and the knockers came in. It was two guys in the back. It was like cut off glass. You couldn't go into the store. Or you had to order from the window. And they put the handcuffs on all of us. I'm standing there opening a pack of Newports. I got my work uniform on. I'm on my way to work. I just stopped to get a pack of cigarettes. And he arrested me. And um, the whole time I'm like, man, I ain't got nothing to do with what they was doing. I just got a pack of cigarettes. I'm on my way to work. I got my uniform on. And the lady that owned the store was trying to tell the policeman I ain't had nothing to do with them two guys because she the one that called the police. Because the one guy kept serving people out her store, and she was trying to tell him that I had nothing to do with it, but they wasn't trying to listen. So they kept me for 72 hours. So I was no call, no show, yeah. and never charged me with anything or any of that. So when I went to John Hopkins, the lady was like, you know you no call, no show, right? And I was trying to explain to her. I was trying to get documentation. I even got the lady that owned the store to call and told her what happened. And she was like, you still was no call, no show. And I was like, okay. So I'm at home and I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do now? Okay. I got what I thought was going to be my last paycheck. I gave my mom some money for the rent. Gave my fiance some money. Kept a couple of dollars for myself. I'm busy running around looking for a job. And by me being a John Hawkins employee, I got direct deposit that I had was a part of the credit union. I'm sitting in the house on a Friday night. I pick up my bank card and I pick up the phone, see if I had any money in the bank. $695, not knowing where it came from. So I went to the nearest ATM and took all the money out before they could fix their mistake and get the money back. That's when my clean time stopped. <laughs> I was off to the races again. $695 worth. Mm -hmm. So your third time here was this time. Mm -hmm. This was your last. Yep. And then between that time and this, and that was how many years? Oh, that man. was like 2000 to 2015. Mm -hmm. So during that time, there was one big incident that took place in your life, and you can share as much as you want to share. 2012. 2012. Memorial Day, May 28th of 2012. The love of my life was taken from me. She was murdered. Um, prior to, um, prior to her being murdered, we had I had like six years clean. She had like four or five. She just came in the house one day and was like, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. And I thought she was talking about our marriage because I was like looking at her like, huh? I had this like dumbfounded look on my face and she was like, why are you looking at me like that? What's the problem? You don't want to be married no more. She was like, I'm not talking about being married. I don't want to be clean anymore. I'm like, are you serious? She was like, yeah. So she decided to go use. That's what she did. And again, anticipating all the pain I was already going to go through, I decided to go with her. So I started using again too. And as usual, two people can't really be together when they're using. Yeah. So we kind of started drifting apart. I stopped looking for her and, um, I went out one day, was helping the kitchen guys unload the truck. He looked at me, and he was like, uh, you seen Tease? Have I seen Tease? Like, you seen Tease? I was like, no, I don't know where she at. He was like, you know what, that's funny. Cause I asked her the same thing, and she said no. She ain't know where you was at either. I said, you saying that like you talk to her? He was like, I talk to her about every other day. 
I leave here, I drive down the street, and I go get lunch, and I talk to her. What do you mean you drive down the street and get lunch and talk to her? Well, right up the street from Mama's is a computer school. Teach go to that school. Oh, I couldn't wait the program I was was over with. I didn't go to the school. I just sat over in the park on the bench where we sit at and get free Wi-Fi. And she came out the door. I ain't call her. I just sat and looked. And when she came out the door, she was like, dropped her books and ran across the street. And when she got across the street, she was like, I didn't see you, but I felt you. James told me he'd been seeing you every other day, and then he told me where you was at. She said, everywhere I go, whether it be the bus, the subway, I'm always looking for you. I was like, feelings mutual. I was always looking for you, too. But I didn't find out where you was at until I stopped looking for you. But, um, yeah, she was murdered in, um, 2012 Memorial Day. And, um, again, I lost my mind. Um, after her memorial, I was still staying in the house that she was killed in. I tried everything not to feel what I was feeling. Marijuana didn't do it. Smoking coke didn't do it. I was on my way to go buy some coke and I seen an associate of mine I hadn't seen in a while and he was giving me his condolences about my wife and and he looked at me and said, I got something that might help you. And he gave me a gram of raw dope. I never liked the way dope made me feel, but it took away all the pain. For how long? For as long as I was high. So that became an everyday thing. Me not knowing that me using the heroin to take away some pain was actually causing me even greater pain. Yeah. Came home one day and the locks was changed. Sad part about it, I seen it coming and didn't care. Yeah. Knocked on the door, my mom let me in, and I said, just let me get some sleep, I'll be gone in the morning. Never slept too good, because I always had nightmares. Got up the next morning and came up here the next morning, and I've been here ever since. What was the biggest thing you had to work on while you were here? Because you'd certainly been through some stuff. What, what was the, probably the biggest thing that you had to wrestle with? Since I've been here, mm-hmm. dealing with my anger and changing my heart. Yeah. Because every time I went somewhere else, even when I came here, after the euphoria of being high and going through the withdrawals, I became a very, 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 very angry individual. Angry at myself angry at the world. 99.8 of my anger was with the dude who took my wife from me. Yeah. Like at my graduation, um, I shared that I was gonna leave. It was my birthday. I got here, um, got my badge March 13th. March 19th was my birthday. Being in my head by myself, I came to the conclusion I didn't wanna be here anymore. But again, you can make plans, but you can't plan the outcome. My father has a very, very funny sense of humor. Every door I went to, my grave was right there. <laughs> it's a lot of things in my life that uh, I'm really grateful for, but me planning to go to treatment, the outcome coming out the way that God wanted it to come out, I'm all right with it. Yeah, I'm all right with it. I don't remember exactly when <laughs> But uh, at some point, the angry AJ that came in here started smiling a lot. Do you remember when that hit? It It was was without my permission. (laughs) It really started happening. And I can remember you wouldn't even, um, you would hardly acknowledge that it was true, but you were doing it and you couldn't help yourself. What you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you said. After I got out of the, uh, if you want to call it, I'm going to call it a phase. A phase of being angry. When Mike told me to talk to Mike, me being still me, I'm looking for the quick fix. I'm thinking that he going to tell me a verse to go to, a chapter to go read, a book to go read. It wasn't that simple. Gave me a bunch of the assignments where I had to do writing, 
And then I'm walking around here thinking about the stuff that I wrote and thinking about the stuff that he said to me. And I wound up in your classroom one Saturday, sitting there thinking about what I'm going to do, looking at your counter over where you keep all the books at. And it was this one white, colorful book that just kept standing out to me, sitting over by the window by the piano. But I kept turning around to look at that book. And I'm like, okay, I guess you want me to read this book. And a lot of the stuff that Mike had me do, that book was talking about the same stuff. Remember the name of the book? No, I do not. I remember when you told me that. Yeah, I still had a book, though. I think it was one of Dr. David Allen's books. It is. It is. I can't remember the name of it, though. In Search of the Heart? I think that was Yeah, that's it. That's uh, it. The heart one. Yeah, yeah, that's it. After reading that, that got locked in my head. Every other time I was in the recovery process, I thought it was about changing my thinking. And it's not about, for me, it's not about changing my thinking. I had to learn how to change my heart and everything else to follow. Yeah. And so far, it's been working, so that's what I'm going to keep on doing. So, got one more question for you. Vulnerability. I knew you was going to do that. I knew it. When you got off the elevator, I knew you was going to do that. Okay, Pastor Gary, what do you want to know about vulnerability? What about, I can't stand that word. We enjoyed very much that on the video. My brothers did too. A powerful moment. It was you being you. Mm -hmm. None of us like it, but we all have learned the, the value and the benefit of letting our heart be open to the Father. Mm-hmm. And um, and when we do that, we're, we can be vulnerable. I don't have a problem with being vulnerable to the Father. I don't have a problem with that because I know he's not going to hurt me. Yeah. Because he has my best intentions at heart. My problem, and this is my stuff, my problem is being vulnerable with people. Yeah. I had to learn to distinguish to what people to be vulnerable with because there's people that have your best interests at heart. But y'all are the people at the home have my best interests at heart. And I know that. So I don't have a problem with being vulnerable. Don't like talking about being vulnerable. <laughs> really, truly don't. Because I don't want you to know I have any vulnerability in me. Yep. I don't want you to know that. I don't want you to know. You almost got me. You almost. All right, all right. I don't want you to know for real, for real. I'm like a Twinkie, like the feeling of a Twinkie. I don't want you to know that. I don't want nobody to know that. Yeah. But sometimes that's a good thing. Long as long as I stay where I'm at, it's a good thing. I just don't want to be angry. Yep. Even though sometimes it's a time to be angry, but I really don't want to be angry. Yeah. So um, you worked your program, which which included counseling, which included work therapy. You had skills and you did your job well. Before you graduated, we made you an intern. Yes, sir. Shocked her. Out me. And uh, you have responsibilities <laughs> for three buildings. You're, the, you're the, the supervisor of housekeeping for three of our buildings. Yes, sir. And I know you take it really diligently. You uh, frequently stop by my class just to just check to give you a shout out. And, yeah, and to check the trash. Yeah, make sure you dump the and trash. Make sure everything's okay. And I'm really, uh, really proud of you. Um, what, what do you think's next? Where are you going from here? I don't know. I haven't really, like... Made any decisions for the far as that. I just go where my father tell me to go and do what he tell me to do. It's about as good as it gets. Well, we've made a lot of progress, and we're just really, really, A, we're just getting started. Yeah, most definitely. Anything else you want to say? Thank you for helping our mission. Well, we're proud of you. And what's happened to you is one of the reasons we do what we do every day. I know that's right. And uh, I know you're going to pass it on to help the next guy. So it's well worth every effort everybody's made. Well, welcome back to Recovery and Doing the Right Thing, bro.